Hello, everyone. Małgorzata Bonikowska, the Center for International Relations from Warsaw. Welcome to our next talk uh, under the umbrella of four takes on the Middle East. Today, we would like to discuss Israel and the region after the war in Ukraine started. We jointly do this series with Elnet, and I am very happy that we are together here today. Uh, Marta? Uh, thank you, Mogosia. Um, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Marta Kubica. I'm the executive director of Elnet Poland. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased to introduce introduce two of our guests. Uh, we'll start we'll start with our guest uh, from Israel, Dr. Vera Michlin Shapir, uh, is an expert on Russia. She focuses on foreign and defense policies and on Russian domestic politics. Um, she was a visiting research fellow at the King Center for Strategic Communications. Uh, she published several books. Uh, and I'm very happy that she found time to be here with us. Uh, it's very nice to see you here, Vera. And I'm also very happy to introduce our, our second guest with us today, Constante Gebert, who is an international reported, uh, reporter and columnist, uh, a democratic opposition activist in the 70s and the underground journalist in the 80s. Uh, Constante Gebert co-founded uh, the Underground Jewish Flying University and the Polish Jewish Intellectual Monthly Midrash among others. Um, Constanta Gebert has taught at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, UC Berkeley, and the Grinnell College. Uh, he has written uh, many books, more than 10, including Israeli history and com commentaries on the Torah. Thank you. We are very happy to have you both. And let me introduce to the, our experts from uh, the Center for International Relations side. Uh, let me start from um, Dr. Jerzy Wojcik, who is our uh, expert on Israel, but he's also uh, a founder of the Isropa Institute and uh, the member of the European Association of Israel Studies, uh, author of several books on Israel and Israel foreign policy and creator of the Auschwitz virtual tour project. So thank you, Jerzy, that you are with us today. And we also have Professor Adriana Łukaszewicz. Hello, Adriana. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Good to have you with us. Adriana is our expert on the Middle East uh, with a specific attention and focus on the Gulf, generally, and um, Arabic countries. And she works as a lecturer at um, Wojminski University and the University of Warsaw, both in Warsaw. And she is economist and political scientist. She covers um, uh, economy, energy market very much, and generally, you know, the interactions, economic and political, between the countries of the Gulf and global security, and uh, also generally the uh, micro and micro economics in the region. So thank you both for being with us. And I think we can start now the discussion. Mar Marta, over to you. Thank you. Um, we're here today to discuss to discuss the development uh, in Israel and in the region, uh, in the Middle East, following the Russia's aggression in Ukraine. Um, we could see that Israel's sympathies are clearly with Ukraine. I'm talking sympathies, not interest. Um, Israelis have rallied uh, for Ukraine, sometimes in really big numbers, uh, privately donated aid. Uh, joined Kiev's fighting ranks. Um, Israeli government also assisted Ukrainians uh, sharing intelligence, sending various forms of humanitarian aid, including a uh, field hospital, um, accepting Ukrainian refugees occasionally, and uh, providing, providing all kind of humanitarian help, including training. Um, also, uh, Jerusalem voted for the United, United Nations General Assembly resolution that condemned Russia's invasion uh, on March uh, 2nd and March 24th, uh, while convincing its uh, newfound ally, the United Arab Emirates, to follow. Uh, however, there are still many voices condemning Israel for not supplying weapons, for not sending Iron Dome to Ukraine, um, my question is, uh, my question to you is, why won't Israel stick out its neck for Ukraine? Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Um, 
I feel that this is a point in time where we really should speak up. I have to say, before I start answering the question, um, I have to uh, kind of put a disclaimer that is quite similar to the disclaimer that I heard today from President Zelensky when he spoke to um, to members of the of um, to the academics, members of staff, and students at Hebrew University. And he said, you know, this is very personal. For me, this is very personal. I was born in Ukraine and grew up in Israel. So talking about Israeli policy in Ukraine, towards Ukraine with all its complications that, that Marta so, um, so um, thoroughly uh, and uh, wisely put forward, it's, it's a very painful topic. It's a very, it's a very personal, a very painful uh, issue. But I was trying to distance myself and give you a kind of a, a professional assessment of, of where we stand with that. Um, and the point is, the problem is really, is that officially Israel doesn't have a policy on Ukraine. Israel chose not to develop a foreign policy towards the most important issue that happened in the world in the last, at least in the last 30 years. This is very concerning in my opinion. This is a huge problem for Israel's foreign policy. And the point is that, and why I'm saying that Israel doesn't have a, a policy towards Ukraine, is that I can come, I can, I can go on here and explain to you and read between the leaves, between the difference of what Tali Bennett, the prime minister, the outgoing prime minister said, and um, the incoming prime minister or interim prime minister, Yair Lapid, said that, you know, one of Tali Bennett was more on the negotiations, uh, remaining a kind of space for negotiation, maintaining space for negotiations with Russia, and Yair Lapid was more hardline against Russia, and the Israeli public was overall pro-Ukrainian. But these are not the main issues. The main issue is that throughout this war, all that Israel, all that official Israel was concerned about is its relationship with Russia in relation to Syria. And this is a big problem. And why is it a big problem? Because Russia intervened in Syria in 2015, in October 2015. The world was completely different. Yes, the world was a world of 2015. And it's Israel could develop a certain understanding, certain understandings with Russia to create some kind of coordination with Russia in Syria in order to pursue goals that I have to underline, there were common goals. Yes, this is not, Russia was not doing Israel any favors when it coordinated with Israel not to clash against each other. Russia needed that coordination with Israel no less than Israel needed the coordination with Russia. For some reasons, I can go into them later. For some reasons, Israel began to think about it as a kind of a, a strategic issue, yes? I mean, I understand the, the, the national security issue here. I understand the problem, I understand the needs, but we have to distance ourselves as policymakers. Policymakers have to distance our, themselves and look at the strategic picture, yeah? So there is an obvious disbalance in this relationship between Russia and Israel, where Israel views uh, this coordination in Syria as far more important for itself than for the Russians. Taking into consideration two phases, the war itself, but also the future after the war, I would presume that they might be some calculations concerning generally the Middle East security and the dynamics um, uh, where Russia is still an important player. So Yezhe, if you, we can start with you, if you can just comment on maybe, you know, the reasons why Israel just behaves like it is behaving right now. Well, of course, actually, it comes about, um, well, it's not only about a strategy, of course, but you're absolutely right. I mean, when it comes to the future, we cannot really predict what's going to happen. But actually, Russia will still be a very important player in the Middle East. And that's what's been implemented, actually, since Ariel Sharon, who is really trying, actually, since Ariel Sharon can actually say about a very much pro-Russian policy when in Israel, but it was still balancing between actually two major partners. Well, strategic partners in this sense, are Russia and America. And it's Israel still is, is exactly in between those two. Um, and and Israel will stay in this position for much, much longer. Um, but it's much more about actually the Russian, it's not just a question of the strategy, it's a much more profound bound that was actually created by the, by the Israeli leadership when it comes to Russia. If you even actually see them, and you remember, all of you remember actually them, Yad Vashem commemorations, I think it was three years ago, when it was the 75th anniversary of the 
and liberation of Auschwitz. Actually, Yad Vashem organized actually their own uh, commemoration of them of the event, and um, Putin was invited. And Putin delivered actually a very politicized speech in front of the international audience. Um, Yad Vashem was criticized heavily for that, but it really all, but it reveals this is not just a question of the strategy. It's um, it's a kind of a much more profound bond between Israeli leadership and uh, and um, and Putin and the and the Russian um, and the Russian country. And of course, we cannot put aside actually the fact that we and of course we know that 1.4 million Israeli citizens that are, that are Russians. It's much more hermetic society than we well can imagine when it comes to actually different minorities. It's much more unpredictable politically, and um, we cannot really actually for we cannot really imagine what would have happened actually if the Israeli changes its strategic policy towards towards Russia. What would be the reaction actually of those of those people? What would be actually the political direction of those people to choose if the situation changes when it comes to the Israeli politics towards towards Russia? I mean, all of the factors really influence the situation. We actually are meeting today a year. I'm sorry, a day a day after the collapse of the of the of the Israeli government. And if, and we can only predict if the next elections will um, give us the return of the king, meaning actually Benjamin Netanyahu, this direction of the being um, sort of allied with the Russians, being um, distanced from the Ukrainian and from the Russian aggression in Ukraine, will be will be continued. That's what exactly Benjamin Netanyahu said at the beginning of the of the Russian aggression. Let's look at Iran. Let's look what is happening around us. Let's not talk about things that are just distant. They're not. They're dead, they don't concern us. Let's focus on our security arrangements. So that's a bit when it comes to the future. I will stop right here. So if I can follow with Mr. Gabbard on a little bit on internal uh, political positions of different political parties in Israel vis-a-vis -vis this conflict. Because from what Yezha says, we can maybe think that Israel is really changing a little bit its position, being in between the US and Russia, which is already a huge change. But what about these internal factors which may uh, you know, change the uh, approach of the, of the uh, Israeli government towards not only Russia, but first of all, to the war itself? As in Europe, we are also quite divided, not how we condemn Russia, everybody condemns Russia, that's obvious, but how to handle the conflict and how to find the right solution to the end of this war. So what is really the, uh, you know, policy? What is What are the opinions among the political leaders in Israel on that? First of all, I'm not really sure that um, Yezha is right when he stresses the internal aspect of the question of the one and a half million Rusim whom you mentioned, um, more or less half are from Ukraine and their sympathies will lie with their home country. This was not an issue before the war. This very clearly is an issue now. And if you look at the preponderance of support for Ukraine amongst the Israeli population, the latest Pew gives us 79% support for Ukraine, 19% for, for Russia. Um, this seems to indicate a rather low factor of Israelis of Russian origins influencing Israeli political decisions. On the other hand, the issue of Syria is fundamental, is practically existential. Um, assessments of the number of missiles that Hezbollah, thanks to Iran, was able to produce or install um, range upwards of 110,000. And if those missiles were to be fired, um, no Iron Dome could protect Israel. Therefore, the Israeli policy of systematically um, destroying Iranian weapons shipments, factories on Syrian territory is crucial for Israeli 
strategic interest indeed for Israel's survival. This seems to be the overriding factor. And because it, for obvious reasons, looms so big, I think the Israeli leadership has lost track of other elements that it needs to consider when determining its policies. As the Americans told Jerusalem, you don't want to be the last guys where it, Russian oligarchs can park their money. Um, if the price for not aggravating Russia and Syria would mean alienating the US and the relationship is already relatively tense, this would of course be an extremely unfavorable trade-off for Israel. Um, Israel probably also underestimated the impact the Ukraine war has in international public opinion. And because it is exposed, it's, it's not towing the line is much more visible than say in the case of another democracy, India, which continues to buy weapons from Russia, that which refuses to align on sanctions against Russia, and nobody seems to notice, even if in practical terms, um, the economic impact of Indian neutrality, quote unquote, is incomparably greater than that of Israel. And finally, um, the very internal diversity of the Israeli government that collapsed yesterday made the very idea of having a common policy on, on anything problematic. In fact, probably everybody in the government was relieved if they agreed we don't need to have a policy on something because aligning the extremely different parties united basically uh, only by their refusal of a return of Bibi Netanyahu to power on anything at all was a quick soaping venture. And this brings me to the last point Will Netanyahu continue his bromance with Putin if he returns to power? And my guess is no. Um, the, Putin today is the last person you want to be seen on a billboard on with the caption, in a league of his own. Uh, Netanyahu, before the elections, had those huge billboards where he was seen with Trump and Modi and Putin. Um, well, this is not the league you want to be seen in nowadays. So if anything, a Netanyahu government, internally more consistent, would probably try to cool relations with Moscow than to stress the guilty bromance that was so important barely a year ago. Interesting perspective. Um, let me just comment on this uh, Israel and India position. I think the difference is just that Israel was always much more, you know, definitely, you know, one line. I'm very, very close uh, ally of the United States. And there was obvious hope that as far as this uh, issue, it will be at least the same. While India was playing swing state for a long time, voting and, you know, always doing uh, things uh, more or less together with even former Soviet Union and then Russia continuously. So uh, it's, it's a slightly different position, but I will continue. This will be my last question in this round and I will get back to Marta. I want to hear from Adriana also how this dynamic with Turkey was mentioned. And I think it's quite interesting. How do you see in a larger sense, the situation in the Middle East around Israel um, Syria included, but not only, especially taking into consideration that we had this Abraham Accord signed, and we have also a different reaction on war in Israel among the Arab states and, and of, of the Gulf, such as Qatar and Kuwait being on one side, and then Saudi Arabia and Emirates and Bahrain on the other side. And just, uh, you know, all these two blocks look at Israel and Syria and Turkey. So mm -hmm. could you just elaborate a little bit on that, uh, especially for the future developments? I just want to add uh, to your discussion at the beginning. I think that the key answer is, from my point of view, what is the position of Russia in the Middle East? What is the power of, uh, of Russia in the Middle East? And what is the future power of Russia in the Middle East? 
what is the impact of war on Ukraine, on the uh, potential activity of Russia in different uh, fields, in different in different countries, in different continents? Uh, I uh, it is. Uh, Thinking like this, you can fully understand that uh, uh, GCC countries, especially Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, they are sitting on the fence. They are between US, uh, USA and, and, and Russia, United States and Russia, and they don't want to, well, at least at the beginning, they don't uh, didn't want to 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 to, to answer that the, the they support this side or another side. They try to be neutral as much as possible. Uh, it seems that uh, the, during the time their uh, uh, political. Uh, um, how to say their political uh, possibilities are uh, uh, diminishing, so diminished. So, so they simply have to answer if they support Russia side, if they support US, if they support the Western countries. Uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding uh, main problems from Gulf, from Gulf point of view, GCC countries is of course Syria, but in context for me, it is in context of Iran. So if Russia wouldn't be able to, to stay in Syria or weaken in Syria and leave Syria, we don't know what happens uh, 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 in the close future, uh, then it is just the open space for Iran. Iran, as you know, for Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates is the main enemy. And this is why they, uh, at least United Arab Emirates and, and uh, Egypt, Bahrain, uh, they started a uh, uh, closer relationship uh, uh, with uh, within the the the, the uh, Abraham Accords, uh, they started cooperation with uh, uh, Israel. Now we notice also the pressure of the U.S. government uh, to uh, involve uh, uh, enlarge uh, and uh, diplomatic relationships between. Uh, between Saudi Arabia and Israel as well to, 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 to enlarge this uh, Abraham uh, Accords. Uh, so, um, well, the, it is not possible to stay aside in this conflict. I think that what, uh, in the situation when, when Russia became weaker, it is, it is not possible to support Russia at this side. From other, uh, uh, on the other hand, we have uh, in July, we, it will be the, the, the visit of uh, President uh, Biden in, in the region, in Gulf countries, as, uh, among them uh, United, uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, we can predict uh, 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 big changes in the narration of Saudi Arabia. So I suppose that they will change uh, their neutral position into a Western position as well as uh, uh, the same will be from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, stop here and get back to Martha with this stress what Adriana said that Russia became weaker. And if this is so, what can we expect from Turkey in Syria? Thank you. So yes, going, go, going, going to Turkey. We more or less know that Turkey stands vis-a-vis -vis NATO in the in the war in Ukraine has not been really unambiguous. And uh, on one hand, we see we see uh, them provide the Ukraine the Bayraktar UAVs. But at the same time, they are tapping the brakes on Sweden and Finland's NATO aspirations. Uh, so my open question is that, do you think it's a matter of tactical opportunism or a more serious rift in NATO's uh, southeastern flank? And uh, how does this Turkey's, I would say, balancing act between the West and Russia uh, play or will play out in the conflict in Syria? Uh, 
and can I can I can I ask Jerzy to answer the question first? That's going to be actually extremely difficult to answer. That actually, to be honest, this is <laughs> we're still actually talking. We're trying to predict things. We're in the middle of the aggression. It haven't haven't finished yet. We're not in a, actually not even in the middle. Actually, this is just somewhere at the beginning of the whole long, very long conflict. I would like to bring a bit bigger picture into this. Um, one of the problems is actually that President Biden did not actually phrase, did not put, did not frame actually this conflict as a kind of a geostrategic, geopolitical conflict of the Russian aggression on Ukraine. He phrased this as a, as a battle between the West, the Western democracies of the, that, protect, that protect their liberal values versus autocratic regimes. And he put into the second corner, not only Russia, but also China. So he really actually made a huge polarization when it comes to our, our world. That's actually for the Middle Eastern countries, it's also very difficult today to, to place itself in this sort of framework. Because actually there are also modern autocratic regimes. They do not belong to the Western world. So it's the same actually with, with Turkey. Turkey is, is a question mark from the, exactly the same reason. That's the question mark, the question mark about the position of Turkey in, in NATO. There's a question mark about actually this cooperation with the Baltic states. What's going to happen in Syria? I would like to be, I would like to give you at least a projection, but it's not going to be the fair and the right projection for sure. But if I, I may follow that to Vera, um, uh, I just want to, following what you said, uh, continue. Does do you think in Israel there is this perception that Russia really is weakening um, because of this conflict, or on the other way around, that you know the time is with Russia and longer the war um, uh, uh, is there, Russia has more chances to finally prevail uh, and definitely at least cut off parts of Ukraine, and that uh, for Israel could be uh, maybe an issue vis-a-vis -vis the security of its own, you know, circulation in, in the Middle East. Because if Russia is not weaker, if it's still strong, Russia still will be a, an important uh, factor in the Middle East. And if you mention Syria and uh, Turkey, that will be also a question about possible uh, scenario for Syria. From the Turkish side, there are voices saying maybe that's a good occasion. If Russia is weaker, then maybe we should, you know, do something in Syria using this opportunity, but is it weaker? Yeah, so I think, I mean, what, what, is, what is weaker and what is stronger in terms when, when we speak about, about Russia and Russia and specific Russia and Syria? I mean, the Russians were managed to, I mean, Syria is a very limited kinetic military operation with very good PR, yes, from the Russian point, from the Russian side. I mean, what the Russians did in Syria was that they had the kind of they provided a, an air umbrella, like an air defense umbrella for for uh, Assad's allies uh, for a period of time that saved him at that particular dark moment for him where he was about to be ousted or killed. Um, and everything afterwards was PR. Everything afterwards was, you know, it, it was a, a whole load of... Uh, of, um, of words about really not, not a lot on the ground. And I think that this is uh, also the kind of coordination that Israel had with Russia, is that the Russians did, um, they um, were willing to use force in Syria, and they were willing to come to the Israelis and to negotiate, to negotiate with them some kind of uh, terms of uh, cohabitation in this uh, very small space. Um, but what did the Russians really, I mean, what, how, how did they provide the Israelis with anything? I mean, it's hard for me to see that, yes. Um, and, and I come back to this issue of, of um, the Russians kind of allowing Israel. What would the Russians do to stop Israel? Would the Russians confront Israel? I mean, when they confronted Turkey in the beginning, in November 2015, it didn't work very well for them. And they realized very quickly that they can't really confront Turkey in Syria because Turkey is much better positioned in terms of its deployment. So, you know, we have to kind of reconsider when we say Russia is moving things, it's a power broker in the Middle East. There is a lot of posturing, a lot of PR here. And I think this PR really had a massive effect on the Israeli strategic discourse. 
and created a sense, a false sense in Israel that Russia somehow is, is, is giving Israel some kind of assurances about what is happening in Syria. Russia gives no assurances to anyone. Russia does what's good for Russia. And, and now what we're having was it's kind of a, you know, what I see now in the debate in Israel is the wag detail kind of thing, yeah? In the sense that, that now the Russians are upset with Israel, yes, in the, in the recent kind of alleged report the uh, activity that Israel had in, in, in Syria, now the Russians are upset with Israel operating in Syria, and now there is a kind of discourse of, oh my God, we shouldn't upset the Russians, or if the Russians get weaker, then they're not gonna provide us some kind of assurances about Syria. I think Israelis need to really take a step back and think about, you know, what 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 really happened here since 2015, yes? And what were the other avenues that the Russians could uh, pursue? I don't think that now in Israel there is a sense that Russia gets weak here in, in Ukraine and it will be better for us in, in Syria. I think there is a lot of, it, it's almost like a psychological game that worked, that there is a worry that Russia will be weak, that the Russians are going to leave and the Iranians are going to come in. The Russians never stopped the Iranians. Yes, it was never the intention to stop the Iranians. They coordinated with the Israelis, like they coordinated with the US and like they coordinated with Turkey because they needed it. They needed it to position themselves as a strong power in the Middle East. Let me at that moment uh, switch into a little bit different maybe angle because I want uh, to ask Mr. Gebert on taking into consideration he uh, knows both Israel and Poland, how uh, if uh, there is a change in perception of Poland also and Eastern European countries, Eastern flank countries in Israel because of the help, you know, and humanitarian aid we are giving and also this migration wave we, we absorbed. It's most of these Ukrainians went to Poland, but also part, partly to Romania, to, to Hungary, to Slovakia, but most of them went to Poland, almost 4 million. And do you think this can somehow, you know, play a role um, in uh, Israeli-Polish relations, because we had this hope. Uh, it was very immediate when, you know, just after war happened, uh, we had a, a reaction, both the governments, but I don't know how this situation looks now, three months after the war. Mm. Well, there's obviously uh, genuine admiration in Israel for the Polish effort, which is quite unprecedented in terms of numbers and also in, in the fact that it is essentially a civil society effort in which the state at the best does not hinder and then gathers credit for what it did not do. But um, apart from that, I don't see it as having a mass impact on Israeli perceptions because immediately the question arises, well, if they could do it for the Ukrainians, how come they couldn't do it for several hundred Kurds who are trying to cross the Belarusian border and who are still denied asylum and people assisting them in Poland are liable to be prosecuted for human trafficking. Um, so here the Polish solidarity seems highly selective and therefore um, less credible than it might have otherwise been. And also, um, I see neither the Polish government nor the Israeli government um, genuinely interested in, in improving of relations. Uh, had there been an, an interest, then the refugee issue could have served as, served as a pretext for such an improvement. But um, neither government seems to have grasped it. They're obviously isn't, isn't much interest in that. And just to return briefly to the earlier Turkey question, um, we need to remember that ambiguities with Turkish policy towards Russia did not begin with the Ukraine war. Um, Turkey has been positioning itself as an entity apart for years before the war in Ukraine started. And it is consistent in its inconsistency, so to speak. Um, the message is um, do not take Turkey for granted. We might be a NATO member, but we'll be following our interests the way we see them. And um, right now, Turkey not only is um, not aligning itself on sanctions against Russia, 
Um, it is also threatening another NATO member, Greece, with war over issues of sovereignty over the Aegean Islands. Um, on the 27th hand, uh, it is threatening a uh, military operation in Syria against um, the declared positions of both the US and Russia. This might be actually the only case since the war where Washington and Moscow seem to have a common opinion of, of anything. And it does seem that the long-term operation is to make it credible to Putin that um, Turkey might actually be made to change alliances, to withdraw from NATO one way or the other. And this is why Russia is tolerating the fact that its troops and Turkish troops are on different sides of the front line in Syria, in Libya, de facto in Karabakh, in the Karabakh war of two years ago, the price of being able to remove Turkey from NATO is so huge that Moscow is willing to go along with Erdogan on mostly everything. And for all we know, Erdogan might be using this simply as a ploy to get concessions from Russia. The way that um, he is using the membership application of Sweden and Finland to obtain what essentially is small change. I mean, the damage that Turkey is doing to itself within NATO by blocking the membership of those two countries, if it's political extortion, is not satisfied, is huge. Even if NATO caves in and um, the PKK will find it more difficult to operate in Sweden and some 30 odd Kurdish refugees will have to flee Sweden for say Norway or Paris or whatever, the gains that Turkey can have are tiny compared to the damage it's doing to itself, which at the end of the day uh, makes one question the rationality, if not indeed the sanity of Erdogan, because he's clearly the only person who is pulling the shots. Reminding us that, uh, you know, Turkey really plays its own game and you can clearly see it even as far as NATO is concerned and Sweden and Finland request to join NATO is used also for the individual, you know, Turkish um, game of interest and most likely Madrid will not conclude this. Um, uh, because of that reason. But let me uh, put last question from my side and then I will take over to Marta, to Adriana, taking into consideration that you really research, your research goes on, um, you know, into the, the en en energy sector. I just want to um, ask you about this game around the, uh, you know, sources of energy, which is absolutely key also in this sense, taking into consideration that Russia is a big, you know, gas station as um, the Americans call it, and also taking into consideration, I think this was Golda Meir who said that Moses let, you know, for 40 years the people to settle down finally in the, the only place in the Middle East that there is no oil, um, uh, this is Israel. So how would you comment about the future, taking into consideration that Russia uses gas and oil and even coal as weapons? And it's quite successful in using it, at least vis-a-vis -vis those who became dependent uh, on it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is a crucial question yes, for, for the whole world, because as we know, the energy is the main factor in the economic development, whatever. Uh, well, uh, we have uh, two uh, opposite uh, reactions on the situation. Uh, 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 regarding uh, energy. The first reaction is from Qatar, the Emirate of Qatar, uh, uh, which uh, provide the world with gas. Uh, uh, was, uh, the, the, the answer from Qatar was positive. So Qatar wants to uh, enlarge the, the, the production and, and is open for uh, for uh, uh, delivering the uh, gas to the European market to stabilize the European market as much as it is possible. Because meanwhile, he signed 
plenty of long-term contracts with Asian countries. So the matter is, we talk about the free, uh, 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 free gas or spare gas uh, uh, without long-term contracts. They said that uh, they are not able to cancel long-term contracts with Asian countries. So we are talking about maybe not relatively narrow part of the gas production, but it is not the full potential of the country which can be uh, which can be used to support western countries regarding uh, saudi arabia and united arab emirates uh, so the, the key actors in the oil market from the opec side uh, uh, the answer was at first negative so for for they said we don't we won't predict uh, we don't predict uh, enlarging production although saudi arabia and united arab emirates may be better saudi arabia is a swing producer in oil it means that they are able to enlarge the production from the scratch yes uh, uh, in one second however uh, uh, Daniel Yergin, which is the expert in oil market, uh, he said that even though if they uh, if they uh, 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 decide to enlarge the production, uh, their production uh, their production is not enough to stabilize the oil market. So this is just the much stronger tensions from the, the, the East, from Russia, the, it can't be neutralized by, by Saudi Arabia and uh, United Arab Emirates. However, it will be better than without enlarging. Uh, it is also interesting that for at least 10 years, uh, when the shell production in the US uh, uh, appeared and, uh, and uh, was developed very fast, and uh, the US started to be exporter of uh, energy instead of being imported of energy, uh, the US uh, authorities thought that uh, they are completely uh, uh, independent from Middle East and the, uh, some uh, uh, tensions from the Middle East uh, 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 on the oil market. And suddenly the war uh, uh, showed that uh, or shows that uh, no one is uh, 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 independent. Even the, even the US with the huge own production notice the growth of energy prices. And thus, this is one of the main reasons why uh, President Biden travel or will travel to the Middle East uh, to negotiate with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and United Emirates about uh, enlarging the, the energy production from their, uh, their sites, it means oil. Yes, because Qatar has gas, they have oil, so the, 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 there's a problem of oil right now. Uh, it is expected, the expectations are that uh, they start negotiation, and this is the matter of proposal from, from Biden. Uh, what uh, uh, at first, of course, what will be the relationships between Biden and Mohammed bin Salman, because this is the main conflict between both uh, 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 person, yes, personally, uh, is personal conflict between, between uh, both uh, men, uh, but uh, it is also uh, um, there are expectations that uh, probably Saudi, uh, uh, the United States uh, propose something very special uh, to uh, Emirates, uh, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, which caused that uh, they changed their, their uh, policy regarding oil. We have to remember that right now we are talking not about OPEC, but we are talking about OPEC plus, which means that their uh, relatively or strong relationship between Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and Russia. So there is a coordination between, uh, between their policy, oil policy or energy policy. I think I conclude from my side is that Russia in the meantime, you know, thanks to huge purchases from China and India mentioned, 
it's not losing. It's even earning more by saying uh, selling oil and gas, despite the cuts it faces from the Western world. So that will definitely be an important factor to think and discuss the future. Marta, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to I would like to ask you the last question before we before we end our meeting today, and I would like to go back to Israel. Uh, well, first of all, as we speak, Yair Lapid is having a press conference with the Turkish uh, foreign minister. He landed in Ankara today, so I think that it will be very interesting to see this conversation and basically, you know, follow up what they what they were discussing about. But uh, uh we we as we know we, we well we have one more we have one more update from israel well today israeli parliament overwhelmingly approved a pre preliminary bill to dissolve itself next week which will pave the you know the road to the fifth elections in the in a three and a half years um i would like to i would like to go back to what vera said at the very beginning that israel doesn't have clear foreign policy towards Ukraine and has never had. Do you think that the upcoming political uh, election campaign will actually be able to not to talk about Ukraine anymore or do will the political parties will have to have a stand to take a decision? Um, decision, for example, regarding joining EU sanctions or international sanctions against against Russia. Uh, how do you how do you see it, uh, Vera? What can we expect? And uh, do you think it, that is that the time to have Israel, you know, having an opinion and a position towards Ukraine? Thank yeah, thank you for this question. I mean, I think that um, actually how I see it is that the root cause, um, in a way, for why Israel doesn't have a policy, why Israel didn't develop a policy in Ukraine was that um, as this war was developing, as this war was kind of unfolding um, very quickly, Israel, the Israeli political uh, system, uh, and as it was very uh, well described in this discussion, it went into a political crisis. So there was an internal crisis going on. I mean, there was a, a, a security crisis with uh, several terrorist attacks. And then on the back of that, there was a, a political crisis. And what happens in Israel when you have like terrorist attacks or political domestic political crisis is that the political system, including people who are usually in charge of, of foreign policy, starting to be very inward looking. And Israel is actually a very inward looking country. It has a very inward looking political elite, and it has very few people who are really focused on foreign policy. And I think that elections are actually reinforcing that. So, I mean, Israel is not, dif is not different from, from other countries that you see in the West where foreign policy issues are not really discussed during election campaigns. Election campaigns are about domestic policy. In Israel, with the exception of certain issues in the Middle East, specifically uh, Israeli-Palestinian relations, because it's such a, an immediate issue it's not really so foreign so unfortunately this is the root cause and this is what we will see that during these elections it will be very hard to push for a more say sober agenda on foreign policy that has to develop uh, now in israel so the hope is that there will be some kind of government i'm not going to say my political opinions but the hope is that there will be some kind of government where a, a discussion about foreign policy can a serious discussion can can restart. Thank you, Kosko. Can I ask you for a comment on that? Um, I can only agree. I mean, I can't imagine an Israeli election turning on an issue that cannot be reduced to whether this is good or bad for the Jews. And obviously, no political party would like to take a position at all because it doesn't know whom it will have to go to bed with after the elections are done. So this is not going to happen. Furthermore, in a way, Israel already has paid the price for not having a Ukraine policy. If there are any benefits to be had from that, and I actually think that if Russia would want to damage Israel and Syria, there's plenty of stuff it can do starting from allowing Assad to use his SS-300 systems against Israeli airplanes. Finally, one of those missiles 
would hit, not to mention the SS-400s, which are much more accurate and could do serious damage. Um, so this benefit is to be maintained. The price has already been paid. And the interests of the entire Israeli political system are elsewhere. Incidentally, I'm also very curious to see um, the result of this press conference um, taking place in Ankara right now. But I'll be extremely surprised if the word Ukraine was even mentioned there. There's so much bilateral to take care of that Ukraine, which certainly was discussed um, between the two ministers, will probably not figure on the agenda of the press conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're coming to you know full hour. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for participation. And uh, I know we were just talking that it's going to be four takes on the Middle East, but with, you know, fifth Israeli elections on the horizon, we can maybe rethink our format and come back to discuss the fifth Israeli elections in, uh, in, in a couple of months. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Marta, here. also for this cooperation. And thank you also all the experts uh, for being with us today. And let's hope to continue this this um, series of debates together. Absolutely. Thank you.